Hello and welcome. This is a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org, a website in English about Ukraine. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org. Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest Ukrainian media NGOs. We continue our series about Ukrainian culture. We try to talk about Ukrainian culture during the war. We consider this is highly important to show how Ukrainian culture is deeply linked to the European and global culture. This cycle is uh, supported by the delegation of the European Union to Ukraine. And today we are going to talk with Vahtan Kibuladze, who is a famous Ukrainian philosopher. And I'm very glad to talk about these issues, uh, about Vahtan. Uh, hello, Vahtan. Hello. Thanks so much for joining me today. So when you think about European intellectual tradition and Ukrainian intellectual tradition, in which sense do you think that Ukrainian intellectual tradition, cultural tradition, is enrooted in the, in the European one? Uh, I think that the Ukrainian intellectual and cultural tradition is uh, is a part of European tradition. So we cannot say that Ukrainian tradition is rooted in European tradition, but we should say that Ukrainian tradition is one of the many different European intellectual traditions. It's a t- typical for Europe, uh, this diversity in unity. Yeah? It's a typical for Europe, it's t- typical for Ukraine. So I- inside our country, inside our cultural tradition, we have many different, not n- uh, only Ukrainian tradition. Jewish tradition is very important for Ukraine. Uh, mm. Mm. Muslim tradition as yeah, well, with yeah, Crimean well. Tatars. Yeah, 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 of course. And uh, for example... Uh, my relatives f- from Eastern Ukraine, they are uh, Greek people. Yeah? And this tradition was also very important. And even the the names of our city, Mariupol, it's, it's from Greece. It's come The from city of, of Mary, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's why it's typical for Ukraine and it, it's typical for the whole Europe. For example, if we uh, look at uh, a German tradition, uh, it's it's um, uh, different, uh, or even even the language, the German language, is the result of the interrelation of the different, uh, so to say, small languages. Yeah, uh, and uh, the birth of Ukrainian language is similar, as for me. Yeah? When we compare German language, the history of German language and the history of Ukrainian language. It's very similar. So, as I said, Ukraine, Ukrainian tradition is not rooted in European tradition. Ukrainian tradition is European tradition, one of the many different uh, Europe, European tradition. It's interesting to see uh, how, for example, in, in, many, in, in many different aspects, the Ukrainian intellectual tradition was also uh, opposing to some of the... European intellectual traditions, like for the, for example, you mentioned Germany. We have uh, in our also uh, tradition like different attitudes to this German culture, German philosophy, German colonizers, etc. And it seems to me that, for example, if we take 19th century, maybe in, among Ukrainian poets, writers, there is a certain mistrust to Western Europe because of the pan-Slavic uh, trend, etc. But increasingly it, it diminishes. I don't know if you agree with me, but if we go into the 20th century, for example, if we go to the 1920s, to Mykola Khvilovy and his like, European orientation, or if we talk about our modernists, Lesya Ukrainka, Kotsubinsky, we see this increased interest to be a part of the European tradition. Do you agree with that? With that? But uh, when you say that it was uh, that the Ukrainian tradition in nineteenth century was opposed to to the European tradition, what do you mean, uh, Shevchenko? Uh, Shevchenko, yeah. On one hand, uh, I can agree with you, but on another hand, uh, as for me, Shevchenko is, t- is typically European in poet. Yeah, it's we can say that he's our Byron. Yeah, it's and. Uh, e, and if we compare, for example, Shevchenko, Byron, and Pushkin, yeah, Pushkin was not rooted in the uh, national culture. Yeah? Shevchenko was rooted in national culture, and, and it was typical for European poetry of this uh, period. 
Exactly. I mean, this searching for roots, for deep folkloric roots, it, it was something that when we talk about this national culture, it's interesting that it was a international trend to, to, to search for these national cultures. But uh, coming back to the our times, uh, we see, for example, some intellectual frameworks, theoretical frameworks, who in the 1990s, uh, who were still considering Ukraine as a part of some kind of civilization. I mean, of course, uh, Huntington and his clash of civilizations and his myopia with regard to the possibility of Russia-Ukraine war. He denied this possibility in his the book Clash of Civilizations, and therefore we see that he was wrong. But uh, there is this um, kind of a tendency or this uh, temptation to see, okay, Ukrainians are Orthodox, they're East Slavic, so they belong to this so-called Russian or Slavic Orthodox civilization. Do you agree with that? Uh, with Huntington? Yes. Of course, no. Yeah, you said it was it a was mistake, it was a great mistake, and it was he was not the first, I would say. Uh, his clash of civilization is rooted, as for me, in the very big and... Uh, very important uh, work by Arnold Toynbee, a study of history. And uh, in Germany, it was Oswald Spengler, uh, Untergang des Abendlandes, uh, the famous book about the different types of civilizations. And Arnold Toynbee uh, said that it is a Russian Orthodox civilization. And uh, for him, uh, Ukraine was uh, the part of this civilization. But as, a, as for me, it was a great mistake, because uh, as for me, Russia is not uh, another type of civilization, and it is not a civilization at all. But as I said and wrote, uh, Russia is shadow of civilization. Russia is shadow of the European civilization. And Ukraine, it's a great question for us till now. Is Ukraine one part of European civilization? And as for me, we, say, we should say yes. Yeah, we are Ukrainian poets, Ukrainian philosophers, Ukrainian, Ukrainian writers, musicians, etc. Uh, we are mm, uh, the part, the natural part of European civilization. And uh, Russian culture, yeah, Russian tradition, uh, as for me, is not part of European civilization. As I say it, it is a shadow of civilization. What do you mean by saying that this is a shadow of civilization? Uh, do you mean that? Do you mean that those content, those values, ideas that are coming from the West, they enter Russian Russian culture and have uh, are becoming absolutely distorted? Yeah, they they uh, receive all main uh, elements of the Rus of the European culture of the European politics. Yeah. And they uh, in Russia they repeat they repeat all these elements, but in perverse way. Yeah? Political structure structure of society, uh, the main topics of poetry and uh, philosophy, and uh, literature, uh, etc. So the shadow repeat the form of the subject, but in the dark perverse way i would agree agree with you on that and uh i don't know i would i would say there are several examples of it for example the progressive idea of marxism or socialism which was a kind of a, also a product of russian so-called westernizers zapadniki uh, when it entered the russian territory it turned into absolutely horrible authoritarian totalitarian state we see that in, in the European context, it rather evolved in the early 20th century into social democracy, and especially after the Second World War. But we can go even deeper. We can, we can see, for example, how progressive for the 19th century idea of people, nation, the idea that uh, we should look for the deep roots of, of culture, and therefore it was emancipation of people who were excluded from culture, the idea of narod, then it was entering the Russian Empire, and it became a kind of a element of oppression. The, this concept of 
народность, when it entered the concept together with concept of orthodoxy and autocracy. But at first it, it, it leads to creation of terroristic organizations in Russia. This idea of, yeah, the, the main terrorists in Russia who were these kind of people, Narodniki, yeah, who, for whom the main... Narodovolts, you mean, yeah. right? Yes. yes. Uh, for them, the main, the main, the main conce- concept was people, yeah? but in perverse way. No? And it leads to, to terror. No, terroristic to to the creation of terroristic organization, and then on the level of the power, uh, Marxism, plus this idea of people of narod, you know, leads to creation of the totalitarian power of in, in Soviet Union. When we talk about Ukraine, would you agree, for example, because for me, one of the key reasons of Ukrainian, key elements of Ukrainian political tradition is the idea of decentralization, is the idea that politics starts from the community. And therefore, uh, we have been saying this on this podcast, that there is this tradition of Hromada in Ukrainian community, which dates back, probably if we take people like Drahomanov, which dates back to ancient... Uh, idea of polis, the city, the self-organized political community. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, and the idea of polis, it's very important for Europe also. Yeah? And uh, the, uh, our our cities have this uh, Magdeburg law, yeah? and it's very important for, for the development of our political and social culture. Uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, this decentralization uh, can lead to anarchy. And this element is also very typical for Ukrainian political and social culture. And now it can be uh, also dangerous because, uh, look, uh, Russia manipulate with, with this notion. Yeah? And all problems in East Ukraine... Uh, there are also the problem of decentralization because, uh, okay, for example, the Donetsk Republic. Uh, is it, what is it for us? Yeah, it's, it's a positive, positive de- development or, uh, and we can say, okay, decentralization and after our victory, we hope, yeah, uh, we can say, okay, it's another district, it's an, another region of our um, country, it has its own its own uh, political culture and political history, uh, but we have Russia, and Russia can manipulate with the, this concept of decentralization. So on the one hand, it's our power, on the other hand, it's our great problem. But I, when I look at this war, for example, I see how the role of the mayors, the role of the heads of the villages, which, which are very important. And therefore, we have cases when the heads of the villages were executed, tortured and executed by the Russian army. We also uh, traveled recently to, to some Ukrainian villages and saw uh, how Russians just misunderstood the, the very concept of, of the head of the village, because for them it was it would be somebody who would impose from 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 the top. In Ukraine, it uh, starost to the head of the village is is a product of this community. So mm, I think it it is it is one of the strength of the Ukrainian political culture to have this politics uh, legitimation of this politics of the political life from below, from the bottom. Do you yeah, agree? Yeah, of course. And it's idea uh, by uh, Hannah Arendt in her book uh, Human Condition that the real power in every society should come from the, uh, from the root, from the root of society. Yeah? That the real power is not uh, an institution. Uh, the, real power, the real power uh, is a function of the healthy life of society. And in, we can say that we have this element of political European political culture in Ukraine. It's very, it's very important. But as I said, on the other hand, it can, it can lead to anarchy. And this element is also, also very typical for uh, Ukraine. So balance, it's very important to, 
to have a balance have between a balance centralized and yeah, decentralized. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You talked about this Magdeburg law, and uh, I think our European audience uh, will not really understand this concept because when you Google Magdeburg law in English or in German, you will not find it because for them it was not Magdeburg law. It was just a typical law for German cities, uh, which, which was taken from the Italian cities, city-states, and which was in their term t- taken, I think, from the Roman law. So the idea that the city or a community is autonomous. In the medieval times, it was autonomous from the, uh, from the feudal, from baron, from kings, etc. Uh, so the influence of this autonomous law for the community was very important for Ukraine. Do you think this is one of the reasons of this, that we are now coming back to this decentralization form of governance? Absolutely. And I think that uh, one of the main monuments in Kiev is the ma- monument uh, to Magdeburg law. Yeah? And it's a symbol of uh, our European political culture. It was important uh, uh, earlier and it's a, it is very important now. And it's a great difference uh, between Ukraine and Russia. As I know, uh, only two, I think, two cities in Russia uh, have this type of law. That's why we have good start condition, but we should uh, use it in positive way. I remember when I was, you know, it, it's very interesting to read the, uh, the, the, um, the texts that were written in the 19th century. Uh, for example, that there is the famous journal Kievska Starina, and sometimes I'm just reading this, these uh, magazines, and there were, for example, uh, I remember reading about a case when uh, a high-level official, Russian official ru- from the Russian Empire, in the 19th century, Ukraine did not exist as a political entity. It existed as a nation, as a culture, but not as a, as a state. And then this high-level o- official was entering uh, a village in Ukraine and, and was saying, look, I'm a higher level official and uh, so I was sent by the governor, etc. And the person who was uh, in charge of the life of this community was saying, okay, but here this is me who is, who is having power, not you, so I don't really care about, about your status. So even in the empire, in the totalitarian, authoritarian form of state, there was this uh, attitude that's interesting. Yeah, and it's very interesting and very important that even the villages in Ukraine have this type of law, not only the cities. And that's why Hromada, you uh, used to this concept, it's not only uh, the description, but it's uh, also the concept of law in, uh, in our history. And it, it is very important for me that even the people who live in village had this type of political culture. Let's talk about another concept which is very important for now, the concept of borders. Uh, this is also, I think, a very, very important concept for you, for your reflection. Mm, I don't know if you agree with me, but my interpretation of the events, why, for example, Russia says it is a civilization, because it is unable to say we are a nation state, which has clear-cut borders. Civilization, or the concept of empire, uh, one of its uh, elements is that neglect it, it neglects the concept of borders. Putin once said that Russia's borders are nowhere. When you say Russia is a civilization, so you ask a question, where does the civilization end? And therefore they produce this concept of Ruski Mir, Every, everywhere where people speak Russian, uh, it can be a, a, a part of Russian territorial claims. Whereas I think the European political culture, at least from the, uh, from the 17th century uh, and with the emergence of the nation states, especially in the 20th century, was rather focused on this idea of borders. And then we go to the Helsinki Final Act and this idea of inviolability of borders. Would you agree with me? Uh, first of all, I would say about political nation. It's very important. And I absolutely agree with you that Russia is not a political nation at all. I wrote about uh, 
this problem in my article in, G in German, it was published two days ago, uh, that Russia is empire, but the social structure is not a structure of political nation. We have a criminal gang on the top of society. It can be Bolsheviks, it can be Putin with his uh, friends. Yeah? Uh, and we have the population. But, but Russia doesn't have a real political na nation with real uh, institutions of political nations, of uh, um, civil society, etc. Yeah? That's why it very hard to say where the border of this uh, social construct. Yeah? Uh, and I agree with you that uh, the language... Uh, plays a very important and very dangerous role because uh, Putin say, says that, okay, where is the Russia? The Russian, uh, where are the, the Russian-speaking people? Yeah? And so that in, uh, that's why it, uh, the, the question of uh, language is very important for us. It's very, sometimes it's, it's very complicated to explain this issue for our colleagues in Germany or in Spain or in the United States, you, you know yeah, that the, the Ukrainian language, it's not only the question of culture, but it is a sign of our political nation. Yeah, that's why Ukrainian language is so important for us. But this idea of borders... Because I think that, uh, of course, we understand that uh, European uh, political history is also a history of uh, empires. It's also a history of violence, of racism, if we talk about the 19th century. But in my opinion, uh, the, the, the crash, uh, the collapse of the empires in the 20th century, European empires, they collapsed one by one. The, the part of the empires collapsed after the First World War, as we know, primarily the Habsburg Empire, the Second German Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire. But then some of them were, you know, regained in the, the status, in particular the Nazism, the Third Empire in Germany, and the Russian Empire. And finally, there was this de-imperialization after the Second World War, first the end of the German Empire, then the end of British, French empires, right? And then we, we are in a situation when Russia is the only empire on the European continent. And, uh, and people in the West do not, I think, uh, do not really understand that sometimes. They continue, continue to think that Russia is a nation state, that there are only Russians are living in Russia. And, um, and, and, and therefore, they do not understand this strife to constant revision of the borders in Russia because the, nation, the idea of nation-state always presumes that uh, political nation, right? That there is a clear-cut borders. And we can understand that, okay, our ethnic minorities live in another country, but we just support them somehow, but not invade other countries to get these territories. In Russia, this concept is not existing. And I think this is because of this neglect of the idea of borders uh, and, uh, and, and seeing a, a political organism as a, an organism which always needs to expand, which always needs to you know, go outside its, its territories. Do you agree with that? Yeah, but I would say that <clears throat> this uh, point of view is deeply rooted in the uh, geopolitical structure of the Russian Empire. It, it's, it is not my idea, it is an idea by Eva Thompson. Uh, Thompson. Uh, she uh, wrote in uh, her book uh, uh, Imperial Knowledge, Russian Literature and Imperialism, that uh, Russia is probably w one empire that has all its colonies in in the body of empire so they th have the problems with the borders inside uh, uh, inside and that's why it's a great question for me it's a big question it's a great problem for for russia itself if we say russia it's not political nation it's not political state it's uh, last empire of europe so uh, 
where the destruction of this empire should be stopped. It's there. Because even the western part of Russia, uh, the population of this western part, is not only Russian people. And if we say about empire, and we say that uh, the Russian empire should be destructed, so we doesn't know, we don't know where this process of destruction should be stopped. Yes, <clears throat> this is, I think, one one of the problems that we we need to face afterwards. But uh, uh, anyway, do you read the process which is? But going? it is a big fear in in Russia, I think. Yeah, yeah th that's why they they need th this expansion. Yeah. But if if we look at, at what's going on, uh, can we apply the same idea that in the 20th century, this is a century of a gradual collapse of, of European empires, can we apply this concept to Russia? If we can apply it, that means that ra the collapse of the Russian Empire is inevitable. And finally, we are witnessing a hundred-year process of collapse of the empire. First, Russia lost Poland and, and Finland, uh, and and the Baltic states uh, after the First World War, then it regained the Baltic states during the Second World War, part of Finland, uh, part, of, part Poland. of Poland as well. Now we are witnessing and 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 created a kind of a, the subjugated states in the Central Europe. Then the collapse of the Soviet Union. It lost, for example, other Soviet republics, but in a way. Soviet Union continued to exist after 1991. Russia more or less controlled these republics, in including Ukraine. So now we are in the process when Russia is, is losing a very important land for, for, for itself, meaning Ukraine, uh, losing forever. And do you think this, this process will continue? I hope so. But I cannot say that it's... Uh, uh, it, it is possible... But uh, but uh, we should find then the different uh, the different centers in uh, inside Russia, the new centers of the new states of the, of the new political states. And I am not sure that politically uh, these uh, part the, these parts of Russia are ready to be to be the new political nations and political states. And uh, it was also the result of repressive politics inside Russia against these national uh, regions. Yeah. Let's come back to these ideas of Ukraine and, and Europe. And I think one of the peculiarities of European civilization is, and this is also the, something that you stress on, is the idea of a city, the idea of a polis. Europe, for, for all of us, is primarily its wonderful cities, which we're still you know, visiting. Well, not now, probably, but, but we hope to visit later. In which sense Ukraine is also a, a country which is focused on the cities? I would, before you answer, I would say the following, that the, the density of cities in Ukraine is probably not as, as high as in, in Western Europe, for example. But we see kind of a remarkable peculiarity of cities. When we talk about Ukraine, we primarily talk about how different these cities are. Because the identity of Dnipro, the city of Dnipro, which considers itself as a frontier city, is very, very interesting. The identity of Odessa, it's, it's a very particular place with its own ambience. The identity of, now we're talking about Mariupol, unfortunately, very much destroyed by the Russians and massacred, but this the city of steel, as we call it, the the the, the image of Kiev, of course, the image of Lviv, and Chernivtsi. Each of these cities is is very different because it has a mu its own history in a way. So we are talking about multiple histories of Ukraine, multiple history of the uh, histories of the cities. Would you agree with this approach? Yeah, and it is w very interesting to compare these two different processes. Uh, on one hand, there are many different cultures on the territory of Ukraine, as we said at the beginning of our dialogue. 
and we can see that the main cities cities in Ukraine uh, are the parts of these different culture cultural narratives and these different cultural traditions uh, and uh, it is very into is uh, I am I am not ready to to discuss this issue, but I think that it's a very interesting subject for for the different uh, investigation, historical uh, history of culture, history of politics, history of of religion, because uh, the different cities uh, represents represent the different uh, religious tradition in in our country. Yeah? And not only Christian tradition, but uh, yeah, so, so so we see a, a very big center in Dnipro Jewish yeah, tradition, Jewish tradition, yeah, Odessa, absolutely. of course, in Kiev also the Jewish tradition, the Jewish tradition, religious tradition and culture tradition is very important for for Kiev, uh, for 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 example we have uh, two synagogues in Kiev, yeah, so for architecture. Architecture is very important, and uh, for for literature, for me it's also uh, when we speak about city. For me, it's also very important to think about: Do we have the real uh, representation of the city in lit in the literature? And if we try to uh, uh, to speak about. Uh, uh, literature uh, the representation of Kiev in literature we should uh, we should say about uh, probably but uh, Pidmohilny yeah Misto his Roman his novel city yeah but city is Kiev it's Ukraine point point of view but at the same time we should we should say about uh, Shalom Aleichem yeah Shalom Aleichem uh, wrote many short stories about the Jewish culture in Kiev, and it's very important. Uh, probably we should say speak about it's it's controversial figure for us uh, Bulgakov. Yeah, it's a it's a Russian point of view on the history of Kiev, and uh, I would say the Soviet point of view on Kiev. Uh, it's uh, Nikrasov. Uh, in native city, yeah, his his novel in native city about Kiev after Second World War. So we in Kiev we have uh, three or four different narrations about Kiev in the literature, and uh, uh, we have Russian, Ukrainian, and Jewish uh, point of view on our city, and it's very important. It's it's very important that we have these, as you said, multiple uh, perspectives. Yeah, multiple representations of Kiev in literature. It's very important, especially when we're talking about the, the Western Ukrainian cities, in particular this shtetl, the Jewish shtetls. So we have a big bunch of literature about that. And in particular, for example, Nobel Prize winners like Agnon, who has written a lot about Buchac, the city which in many aspects is not existing. I mean, it, it, it exists, you can go to Buchach, you can see still the fantastic remains of, of the, the sculptures of Pinzel, one of the greatest uh, Baroque Rococo sculptures in Galicia. Um, you can see also the, the little courtyard but, uh, by Agnon, but of course we can't imagine, unfortunately, uh, the, the way how this city was living as a Jewish city, because uh, it was destroyed in many aspects even before the Second World War, so it diminished its, 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 its Jewish presence after the First World War as a result of pogroms and, of course, after the Holocaust. So this is another, I think, another aspect of, of Ukrainian culture which only starts to kind of excavate, the excavation of memory. We are talking about Jewish memory, we are talking about Ukrainian memory, I think it's one of the light light motifs of this Ukrainian Ukrainian culture that so many things were lost because of the deep sufferings, because of the massacres, violence. Do you agree with that? Yeah, of course, bloody lands, the notion by uh, Timothy Snyder, our country is the territory of bloody lands. It's a pity. It's a pity very much, but uh, 
it's history repeating. Yeah, now we we see the new wave of violence, and uh, I hope so that it's the last one, and we can we can say after that that we we. Uh, we, we saved all these traditions, the Jewish tradition, the Ukrainian tradition, uh, and we ha have a chance to develop all of them on the territory of Ukraine. And it's it's also uh, very typical for for your European style of life to to save the traditions uh, and to. To save this di diversity uh, of cultural, uh, re religious, and, and political traditions. Maybe my last question: We are making this podcast the day after Ukrainian uh, group Kalush Orchestra won the Eurovision. I'm asking you not uh, as a not only as a philosopher but also as a musician. We see this uh, revolution, cultural revolution in Ukraine. I think in the past decades. This, uh, when musicians uh, rediscover the folkloric Ukrainian, the folk music, and using Ukrainian folk instruments, Ukrainian clothes, uh, etc. And I think this is one of the biggest trend. But at the same time, it's not a typical folk. It's a it's a fusion between very archaic uh, melodies, very archaic traditions, but also very modern. Uh, expression styles, the rhythms, the the styles, etc. The Kalush Orchestra is a, is a folk music, but at the same time a rap, right? We have so many other other uh, fantastic ethno bands. Do you think that that's really something very very new, and that Ukrainian culture is incredibly, in my opinion, incredibly enriching right now the European culture with this? kind of a modernizing folkloric trend. Uh, absolutely, and uh, I think that it's part of the universal uh, process that this uh, world music, yeah, it's it's popular not uh, only in Ukraine, it's popular all over the world. And uh, in this way, this uh, Ukrainian process is their part of the big universal process all over the world. And we compare this process with the 19th century. Yeah? Shevchenko and other Ukrainian poets uh, try to find the roots of their poetry uh, in, in, their, um, in the folk uh, poetry, in the f folk literature. And now, uh, and it, it was typical for, for Europe, and now it's typical for, for the whole world to search the roots of music in, in the folk music, but uh, to make it in a new way. Yeah? Uh, yeah, and it's typical for Ukraine, and it's typical for the uh, whole world, as I say. Yeah, and there are so many things to discover in Ukrainian culture. I hope we try to uh, kind of a, give you an introduction into the very different ways in which Ukrainian culture is deeply linked, deeply connected to other European cultures, to, to European tradition. We talked about the political culture, this culture of decentralization. We talked about the multicultural nature of Ukrainian culture, right, which combines different religions, different ethnicities. And we talked about this interesting fusion between, between the folklore the uh, ethnic traditions and modernity. This was a Explaining Ukraine podcast, a podcast by ukraineworld.org. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org. Uh, I was happy to talk with Vachtan Kibuladze, one of the most prominent and well-known Ukrainian philosophers and professor at Kyiv National Taras Shevchenko University. This series about Ukrainian culture is supported by the delegation of the European Union to Ukraine. Uh, you can support us at patreon.com slash Ukraine world. Also on, uh, listen to us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, SoundCloud. Follow our networks on Twitter and Facebook. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.